All right, so welcome back. So if you've been following the channel and you've been noticing my upload schedule, you know it's not all that great. I maybe average like one video a month or something like that. It's abysmal, I know. But part of it is I do really detailed deep dive type reviews where I talk about pretty much everything that's on my mind. They're not for everyone and they take a ridiculous amount of time to plan, record, and put together. So I'm trying to do something different here. And don't worry, I'm not throwing those out the window. They're still in the works whenever my stupid schedule allows and whenever the spirit moves me, but these right here are going to be different. I'm calling them shallow dives, as in not deep dives, they're going to be much shallower. So they're not exactly reviews, but don't get me wrong there either. I'm still speaking my mind, these are not overviews. Overviews imply that these are all the good with none of the bad. I still reserve the right to be as honest and as negative as I want. So it's just that these are not always going to be like real reviews. They're going to be much shorter, I'll group like three of them together for a video or something like that. So I guess mini, re mini reviews, hot takes, random thoughts, spur of the moment recordings, sometimes just rants I guess, no rhyme or reason to any of this. Whatever the hell you want to call it, I'm just hoping it lets me get more stuff out there. Since it's going to be a lot less work, I can record them in parts and just kind of have them done whenever. Also, the other thing is, I normally I normally review higher-end stuff, since there's just more to talk about with those. These are going to feature mostly lower to mid-range production knives, so it'll be something different. I could go out there and put out like a 30-minute review of a Delica, no one would watch it, I would be bored, you would zone out. And there would just be nothing that I could say that hasn't already been said by at least like, I don't know, 50 other channels out there with Spyderco Delica reviews. That's already been beaten to death. So I'm trying to do something different here. Anyways, I hate intros. Let's get right into it. And speaking of beaten to death, Spyderco Capara. This thing has just been huge for Spyderco these last couple months. It's on everyone's wish list. They basically sold out as soon as they reached dealers for a while. That's kind of calmed down a bit, but it kind of feels like demand is still up there. Spyderco is probably my favorite mid-range production company. They do a lot that I like and a lot that I don't like as well. And this one's kind of like a weird mix of both. But first up, I never liked the wire clip. I know a lot of people like them, it's just not for me. It's not because they look cheap, a lot of people like to mention that, but I actually think it looks pretty good. It kind of fits with the knife, and there's hardly a knife that it doesn't really fit with, but it looks good. My problem is this, I've never had a wire clip that didn't move all over the place, and the deep carry ones like this, they're just the worst defenders. Just look at this. Kind of see it moving like that? Yeah, that's how much it moves, and this thing is down tight back here. So, it just makes the knife feel flimsy in hand, like it's not a solid tool. It might just be a mental thing, but it still annoys me. And the other thing is, if there was actually titanium underneath this, you see this ugly crescent-shaped mark that this thing leaves when it drags alongside the scale? I'm not a fan of that. You can even see it on the carbon fiber. It blends in a lot more, so I don't know if I can show it. But it actually is there, take my word for it. The other thing is, I just don't really idolize the Spyderco compression lock like some other people do. It's a fine lock, it's a great lock, it's a cool thing to have, but it's just not really a selling point for me. It's just another lock that I think is solid. I trust it, and it's a good design, it's innovative, but that's basically where it ends. I trust it. Some people want the compression lock on every knife, I think they just don't know too much about knife design, it doesn't work on every knife, but I'm getting off track here. But what I'm trying to say is, on this design at least, it works great. Some people have said it was slippery. Just not for me. I've never dropped this, never come close to dropping it. They said the smooth carbon fiber, fiber might be a problem. This is how I normally close it. Not the case for me. And also, while I'm just on this subject, just a small rant, but anyone who says the compression lock is ambidextrous and lefty friendly, they have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. I'm actually left-handed here. I carry right because, you know, most knives out there are actually right-handed. I don't like limiting my selections, but sometimes I take out a knife, put it in my left hand, open it from there. To close a compression lock left-handed, I basically treat it like a back lock. I have it like this, my finger's kind of blocking it. Let it fall there, and close it like that. Basically just like a back lock. It's awkward, it takes more doing. I can swing it closed with my right, no problem. But when I do that, do you see how many points of contact I have here? It's basically squeezed between my middle finger and my thumb. It's just pinched right there. It's not going anywhere. I have it in my left hand, and I can do it. I'll show you right now. Do that, and you let it fall shut. 
But the problem is, if I even move my hand slightly like that, I drop it. So if I had to close it normally like this, I'd either probably throw it at my stomach or impale my foot. There's just nothing holding this top part over here, so I don't have anything resembling a secure grip. I mean, I can close it left-handed, but I would call a liner lock or a frame lock just much more lefty-friendly. Moving on to a part that I actually do like though, and that's almost everything else. This thing is mechanically perfect. Perfect detent, spidey flickable, it has the bushing pivot too that they CQI'd, but so this one actually kind of drops shut. Centering is right on. And I can't get any up and down play on this one. Not at all. I get a tiny bit of side to side, but it's hardly even worth mentioning. It's just so slight that you'll never really feel it unless you're checking for it. I've said for a long time too that Spyderco actually does some of the best production company carbon fiber, and that's on full display right here. This thing is beautifully polished, it's contoured, it's on both sides. Just look at the way that thing plays with the light right there. This is easily my favorite part. And you also have a red backspacer right here, this thing is G10. I think that's very tastefully done. Red is a color you just don't really see enough of in the, nice in the knife world, and it kind of goes with the original name that the designer had for it. But with all that said, I still don't like this knife. It just never really connected with me. Like when I got it, I got it because, well, everyone was going on about it, but it felt oddly familiar. And I really wanted to like it, but I just couldn't figure out, I couldn't put my finger on why I did it. And it wasn't until I dug this one back out and carried it again. This right here is a Spider Co. Magnitude. And if I put them side by side, you can kind of see the similarities right there. It's a completely different designer, but they're kind of doing the same thing. It has this kind of like, well, I mean, that one was made to be a cooking knife, but this one kind of does the same thing. You kind of have the blade right here. If you were to rest on a surface, your fingers are tucked away. It's basically about the same thing on the magnitude too, but basically completely different designer, but same factory, same carbon fiber, same function, just different approach to really get there. The Capara, like, in comparison, it just feels like an overly slimmed down version of the Magnitude. Like, it's anorexic or something. But you hold them the exact same way. Both of them present the edge towards what you're cutting. They have a similar handle shape, thumb ramp, forward choil, that beautiful carbon fiber right there. It's present right here, too. But it just... Something's off here when I, when I actually pick up the Capara. It just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like it was really meant to be in my hand. It doesn't feel like it's locked in. And it just, it's not uncomfortable. I don't want you to think that, but it just feels like it's overly slim. It feels like a compromise. I don't know. It's just people keep asking for smaller and slimmer and thinner knives these days. Just realize that you really do lose something when you do that. The Capara never really made much sense to me in hand. It just wasn't really all that comfortable. It's just overly thin. For an actual user, I'd probably go with the Magnitude 9 times out of 10. If you're really picking up what the Capara is, what the Capara is putting down though, then I can't recommend it highly enough. Build quality wise, this is probably Spyderco at their best. And it's even better than the Magnitude, I'll actually show you right now. I don't know how well you can hear that, but that was lock slip right there. It's not unsafe, but there is a bit. But Anyways, if I'm going to choose between these two, which I actually am going to, one of them is staying and the other one is going. And I'm pretty sure you guys can figure out which one is which. Next up, Boker Quaken. Quaken suck. Next. Okay, fine. So I'm going to be brief, but I'm not going to be that brief. It's no secret that I don't like Quakens. To me, they're basically the ultimate form over function design. Like, when a maker goes out and makes a Quaken, it basically sucks the creativity out of them. Like, go out there. How do you make a Quaken? Basically, oh, straight handle, nothing on it, slightly upswept, maybe dead straight, hide the blade in the frame when it's closed, maybe a tanto, there, boom, I basically described every Quaken out there. And what does a Quaken excel at? Nothing. What's the point of them? To hide the blade in the frame when it's closed. And what does that win you? A host of knife design issues. Not all of them are that bad, and there are actually some out there that I do like, but those are rare. Here's just a short list of all too common Quaken problems. Uninspired ergonomics, unbalanced blade to handle ratio, borderline expo exposed tip when closed, way too slim in hand, blade edge that hits the backspacer. 
But by far the most common thing is actually this right here, basically exposed blade edge in the back when the thing is closed. I wouldn't say it's easy for you to cut yourself when this one's closed, but I also wouldn't say it's a non-issue weaver. No one's going to die from it, but it is annoying. Let's say you go out there and you fumble this one, getting it out of your pocket. Drop it onto some gravel, you will get some dings on the edge of your closed knife. That is just stupid. Even worse is when the blade taps the backspacer. I've had custom Quakens that do that. One was even from a top-end custom maker. In a folding knife, a blade that is the same size as the handle won't fit in the handle. That's just basic spatial reasoning right there. But there's something hardwired into our minds that makes us want balance. That's why you get people out there complaining about blade to handle ratio. Makers know this. And what they do on normal folding knives is they make the blade a bit taller. So that when it's closed, it kind of sticks out of the frame a little bit. It doesn't hurt a thing. So, But it does make the thing more, look taller and more balanced when open. So on a Quaken, you don't get that. You have to space inside the frame and that's it. A Quaken is a very restrictive design. Put too little blade in there and the thing looks horribly balanced. Put too much and you have the knife making sins unlisted above. It's very hard to balance aesthetics with good knife design. But the question is, is it worth it? And that's a hard no from me. For one, most of these are upswept to go with the whole Japanese theme here. Those just aren't really my preference. The blade will curve away from what you're cutting, so you end up having to angle your wrist in a strange way to actually cut something on a surface. So that's not good for me. And the other thing is, the handles on these are usually dead straight. And they're usually very simple designs. It looks good, but I like ergonomics that lock you in. Neutral handles aren't my preference. Most of them carry very well, but that and that's a plus. But the thing is, if you want a slim carry profile, there are plenty of other different and frankly better designs out there. Like, don't even try it with me. People who want Quakens want them for the aesthetics. That's going to be the main thing you're after if you go after one. And if that's your thing, then that's fine. Do your thing. Do what makes you happy. I'm just explaining my thought process on these and why they don't fit in my life. I'm not telling you not to go for them. I want people to think for themselves. Okay, um, I was actually about to cut that, but then I realized I haven't really said a thing that was specific to Boker, so um, guess I'll make this quick. Alright, so as far as Quakens go, this one's very middle of the road. I basically have it on the table because it kicked off the whole Quaken craze a few years ago. So I have it here representing Quakens as a whole. So I handled a few, and QC on these are actually pretty decent, even though Boker has a bad reputation on that. This one is centered, will not move when locked. It's decently smooth. It has an okay flipping action. It's not great, but it is okay. I also did this stupid bounce off the stop pin thing before the Grimm's most made cool. Like, sometimes I find myself just like, well, God damn it, why won't this thing close? You can almost make a game out of it. And it really is annoying when you really do just want to close your knife. Blade is exposed in the back here. We basically ran over, went over that. Tip is well recessed on this one, but I swear that wasn't always the case here. I, would, I could have sworn I had an old one that had the had the blade tip right here, I was actually level with the handle edge. So it was very exposed and very snaggy. Also, just on this one, never win for backspacers that wrap all the way around the tip. I'm tired of seeing just standoffs on all of these. Blade to handle ratio right here is noticeably off, but worse here is actually to balance. Balance point for this knife is behind the first handle screw, all the way over here. Let's see if I can show it. Yeah, I kind of see it balancing right there. But uh, the thing is, this one is the carbon fiber scaled version, and it's easily the best version I've found. If you get the full tie scaled one, it's retardedly dense. I don't complain about weight normally, but it needs to go with the design. Like, there's a time and place for most things. Like, I'll carry a Medford because I want to carry a Medford. I know it's going to be heavy. I want to carry it. I know what I'm getting myself into there. But for the full tie version of this one... It's a heavy, slim carry knife with terrible balance that is made worse by the weight. That's just not the way to go on these. It defeats the main purpose here. And as most reviewers have said, the flipper on this one, backwards. Backwards. Having it the other ways would just be better for ergonomics. It would leave less dead space, I would get closer to the edge, and it would just let me actually catch that flipper consistently. A lot of time, I can half flip this thing. Let me see if I can. Like that. Because the detent isn't really all that strong, and the smooth part right here is actually the one that I'm pulling on, where the actual shaped part is back here. That makes zero sense to me. In hand, it's not too bad. See? See? Just half-flipped it right there. 
In hand, it's not too bad. The, light, the lock bar on the outside part over here could use a slight chamfer just because it moves away from the carbon fiber scale. And it's upswept, and I don't like that, but it does like to be held like this. So when you cut on the surface, it basically acts like it's straight. So that's not really a big deal. Not a fan of neutral handles, but as far as neutral handles go, I guess this one's fine. Okay, that was both more of a rant and more of a review than I actually wanted. Well, you win some, you lose some. Moving on. So the Kershaw induction really was a knife that came out of nowhere and just sucker punched me square in the jaw. It has no right to be as good as it is for this price. I was honestly expecting nothing from this one when I added it to the cart, and I added it just for the hell of it. It looked weird enough, and I liked the Hawks enough, so I gave it a shot. I didn't expect much, but when I got it... Let me just run you through what I got, actually. I got the Hawk Lock right here, unassisted bearings, a top-notch action, perfect centering, Decently good lockup and one of the sharpest factory edges I've gotten in a while. All of this for less than what I pay in bridge tolls commuting each week. These are 40 bucks normally. I paid less than that when it was on sale. But 40 bucks normally. Let's just go with that price right there. Why is nobody talking about this? This is not just another boring, lazy budget knife here. It has style to it. It has that two-tone blade right there, satin on the flats, black on the black, I think like, about what it was. But it's not DLC. It's some kind of coating, but... Uh, black frame, good looking plate of GFN holding the lock stuff inside, and those funky lines that actually do flow pretty well right here from blade to handle. This is a designed piece through and through, but above all, this is function first. This is a user design. It's not relying on texturing to stay in your hand. This, this thing's actually quite slick if you just touch the side over here. It's using the lines and the and the stock thickness right here to give you a good grip. It's a small knife that still manages to lock you in and fill your hand. Ergonomics are spot on. There is zero dead space here. The flipper is completely tucked away when it's open, and you can get right up next to that edge right here. It's meant to be used with that choil, and it feels great in either a saber grip or a hammer grip. It feels like you could really get some work done with this one. And look back here. They blocked off the edge right here. So it's unsharpened right here. So I have no fear of nicking myself or getting too close to that edge. Is it going to recurve over time? Yes, but does that matter on a user? No. Like it or not, sharpening choils are an aesthetic consideration. People like it because it gives them a nice pretty edge all the way to the end to the heel. It doesn't really win you much from a function standpoint. To me, a sharpening choil is just another place for stuff that you're cutting to get hung up on and bind up. Even if it recurves from sharpening over time, the material will still be pushed over to a sharpened edge and it will still get cut. This was a good design touch, and I think this is just a great design in general. Just on design and price alone, this has already sold it for me. But what makes this so great is that on top of all that, you get the hawk lock right here. You can fish it with this thing all day. It's more fun than an access lock because it's a flipper as well, and you won't even touch a Benchmade for anywhere near this price. You just saw the flipping action firsthand. It's good. I wouldn't call this knife perfect by any means, but everything on this one is basically forgiven. Lockup isn't perfect. There's a bit, slight little bit of up and down play that I don't even know should really be a consideration, but I trust it. It's safe. Also, it's a hawk lock for 40 bucks. What more do you want? Blade Steel, 8CR 13 MOV. Again, 40 bucks, I don't care. It's only an aluminum frame lock. Or, why I say frame lock? It's only aluminum on the frame. I like how people always find a way to complain about that. It's never really an issue at all. I want to see you try to destroy a piece of aluminum that's this thick by hand. Trust me, it'll last longer than you. Also, since it's hard anodized like this, it's very smooth. So unless that clip right here go in and out of pocket with ease. The only real complaint I have with this one, it has nothing to do with the knife itself, but I don't know about you guys. But for any price, I expect a new knife to actually be new, not, I mean like unused, not beaten up, devoid of wear, you know what I mean. I bought this one brand new from a dealer, but look at this. Don't know how well I can show it on camera, but there's a scratch right there. And some dings right here that you can actually feel. It's not just a visual thing. So it feels like this one looks like, okay, it looks like this one had a previous owner and that previous owner may or may not have been a dog because it does look a bit chewed up. So I don't think they really have an excuse for this. Even at 40 bucks, I still expect a new thing to be new. 
But again, for 40 bucks, I can't really complain all that much. So I'd say get this one while you still can. I, it's sad to see this one get discontinued. But anyways, thanks. Um, that's it for this one. Take care.